with the theme that has been set in the singing of that hymn, and that is that we would see, we would see from our hearts the glory of the Lord Jesus and his great salvation. So we're in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. It's always good to have our Bibles open. Spanish, it's a Spanish uh, translation to give the basics of the message uh, this morning. And our theme is that our eyes must be opened. Our eyes need to be opened. We know this in a very practical way, don't we? You're cutting some vegetables at home. You'll be recommended you got your eyes open. You won't have problems otherwise. Is that wrong? Sometimes we might see something. We might see something just beautiful or to view or remember uh, June 2021, we went up to the silver vaults up in Holborn, you go down, and you've got all these shops that have got nothing but silver. <laughs> it's worth a visit. Silver, silver, silver. Well, if you're there and you're seeing the silver and you've got somebody with you and you say to them, isn't this dramatic? And they have got their eyes closed. And they won't see anything. They won't see anything. Open up your eyes and you see all this array of silver. And there's lots of illustrations you might have in your own life when you've seen a beautiful scene. And to enjoy it, you've got to have your eyes open. And that's the theme we want to bring into a spiritual sense today. Our eyes need to be opened to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Our eyes need to be opened to see his salvation, and therefore to embrace his salvation. The problem for many of us is we're just happy to have our eyes closed. Somebody says, take time, go and find out about the Lord Jesus, go, go and see what it's like. Go and, go and read the word of God. Go and find out about his great salvation, which he made on the cross. And so many people say, well, not interesting. I'm just happy to have my eyes closed. You've got your eyes closed. You'll have no appreciation of this Lord Jesus Christ who we're celebrating this morning. You see, we don't realize our need. We don't realize that we're so empty without him, that we need him as the bread of life. We don't realize the terrible situation we're in without him in our sin and how bad it is to be away from God. And Jesus has come that we might be brought to God. Open my eyes, Christians. I, I trust we, 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 we're wanting this morning. Lord, I want to see the Lord Jesus and his salvation afresh this morning. And I want us to embrace this Savior and this salvation. Many of us might realize something about uh, the, the Lord Jesus and what he has done. It's a fact. We've been to church. We are aware of these things, but as we see, I want us to respond that the salvation of the Lord Jesus is not just a fact, but a personal experience, a real living experience of the living Lord Jesus Christ. It's a salvation day today, everybody, Christians, I want you to know that. Don't shut down and think I became a Christian back in 2002, and that happened then, and now I'm we want, we want more of it. We want to get into it. And this beautiful Savior to love him more. 
Now, last time, two weeks ago, we were in the earlier part of Luke's gospel, and we were thinking, finally, at that, that, that time, about how there was a, a salvation. It, it all seemed impossible. And the Lord Jesus mentions about it there in verse 27. He says, but he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Men, ourselves, we can't get this salvation, but God is the God who's in the business of bringing this salvation, making it possible for us in all of our helplessness and hopelessness to become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ to have this salvation. It's God's working. Now, as we expand into thinking about what we've uh, looked at in Luke's gospel in chapter 18 so far, we've been thinking about the need to really be a disciple, truly to be a disciple. From chapter 9, verse 51 onwards, we've been following the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to glory through the cross. And we've been finding teachings about what it is to be a follower of the Lord Jesus. And it's as if chapter 18 just says, oh, hold on, everybody, hold on. Don't just be assuming that you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus. These are the basics of what you need to be a true disciple of the Lord Jesus. And those things have been unfolded in chapter 18. And we'll visit those as we go through this morning time. So first of all, as we're coming into our passage uh, this morning, uh, the Lord Jesus states that there is a salvation provided. There is a salvation provided. With man, it's impossible, but God, it's possible, and he has made it possible, essentially saying, so first of all, there is a salvation. He's made the salvation. Look at it there in verses 31 through to 33. Una salvation provisa, a salvation provided. Think, first of all, as we're looking in these verses, what do you see? He's taking the 12. Who are the 12? They're the disciples. We're going to teach them there is a salvation. Says to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. That sounds familiar. We're on the journey to Jerusalem, where he is going to have to die. And everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. First thing I want to uh, notice there, we're talking about prophecy fulfilled. We're thinking about all of the statements in the Old Testament, which would indicate about a Messiah who would come to rescue his people from their sins. Go to Psalm 22. You can see the one who comes and suffers under the terrible circumstances of the cross. It's a prophecy in Isaiah 53 about the servant who would suffer. And you can start to go into the New Testament, the Old Testament, and see the scriptures that would tell us one who would come which would remind us as a basic point, everybody, we are a Bible church, okay? A whole Bible church. We are an Old Testament and a New Testament Bible church. Don't swallow the lie which says, well, it's just New Testament now, and we just ditch the Old Testament. No, we not. No, not. It's the Old Testament which provides the anticipation for the New Testament we're in, there is fulfillment. So we're a whole Bible church. God has one coherent plan. It's not as if the Old Testament was, well, that was a big failure. We didn't get very far then. We'll have to start again in the New Testament. No, it's God's plan from eternity brought into time going through. Children, everybody remember that as you study your Bible, it is one big plan. And so the prophets, they were saying about this son of man, this person, you've got the prophets then, the Old Testament, then you've got this person, the son of man. That great figure revealed, particularly in Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 to 14, and he comes into uh, this world. 
and he comes to do all of the will of God. See him there in verse uh, 31. The Son of Man. It's about the Son of Man and what will be accomplished by him. And what will be accomplished? Well, there will be the undertaking of the cross. There will be the experience of the cross. There will be the delivering over to the Gentiles, being mocked and shamefully treated and spat upon, a flogging and a killing and a rising from the dead on the third day. This is Son of Man achieving all the will of God. The will of God, salvation is achieved through sacrifice. Victory is achieved through death. Strife comes through his humiliation. This is salvation. This is him taking the sin of his people. Of all who believe, he's making salvation. There is a salvation provided. If I go back to my vault of silver, it wasn't as if we appeared there and there were bare shelves and it was all just a bit of a joke that you got you there saying there was loads of silver there. There was real silver and you could see it. And there's a real salvation that we can see and that we can enter in. If you had your money for that silver and you wanted it, you could pay your money and get it. <coughs> I didn't do that myself, but I hastened to add. It was pretty expensive. However, the point is made. We want this salvation. It's not a thing of our imaginations. It's a real event of history. Prophesied and undertaken by a real person who came and took our place. Remember the term son of man has all of the implications of one coming in that glorious way, coming into our place to achieve a salvation for us. So that is a salvation provided. Be encouraged brothers and sisters in Christ. We're dealing with the real things of life here. Let's be drawn into a real appreciation of our dear Savior. Let's think secondly with regard to a salvation hidden in verse 34. Una salvación escondida in verse 34. The problem with the disciples, they could not see this because their thinking was all in the wrong direction. What was wrong? Because the gods of the people at that time, even the religious teachers, was that Messiah would come and he would crush his enemies. It wouldn't be his death, it would be the death of everybody else. Victory would come through a mighty conquering event of putting down others. And that would be the salvation for the nation of Israel. And that thinking was all around. They hadn't got a true understanding of the word of God. It was hidden from them, it says there in verse 34. They could not grasp it. There's some deep and interesting things to consider that I don't think we can fully get into here. That they couldn't understand it, but they were, it was hidden from them. It's as if God had kept it from them. But I think there is an important order here. The first thing is that they didn't understand. And the second thing stated then is that it was hidden from them. They did not grasp it. There's a basic principle of spiritual life, I believe, that if you want to understand, you will understand it. If you do seek to know the word of God, you will, will, will understand the word of God. 
those who want to know the salvation of God will know the salvation of God. For those who don't want to know, those who are happy, as it were, to exist in some vague thought, oh, every religion will get me to God. One, one salvation message is as good as another salvation message. Don't trouble me about this saviour who came as the only saviour. Then it'll be hidden from you. It'll be hidden from you. And you won't grasp it. The challenge, the challenge to us this morning is, do we want to understand? Do we want to really engage and know the way of God? The disciples should have known better. Dare I say, they should have been asking the master, please help us to understand these things. So if we ask, we can be anticipating that we will understand. And I say to us fellow Christians this morning, don't just sit around, as it were, being confused by certain scriptures and saying, well, I don't understand that. It may not fit with what I think. I'll, I, I'll just leave it. I don't really want to understand what God is saying. It all seems a bit strange to me. I say, brothers and sisters, let us seek the Lord in his word. Seek the hard things. Seek the complicated things. Seek to know God from his word that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's our second point of this morning. There is a salvation hidden. We dare even say there are some disciples who were blind, spiritually blind. Let's go on to point number three. Point number three. Salvation received. Una salvación recibida. Una salvación recibida. Salvation received. So what do we find? And what do we find? In verse number 35, what do we find? What does it say, everybody? We find... A blind man. Surprise, surprise. We find a blind man. So as he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. So we've got blind disciples. We've got a blind man. And so he is a beggar. And so what do we think? That should ring a few bells, shouldn't it? <laughs> Why should it ring a few bells? Because here's a blind, here's a beggar. He's got nothing to offer. He's completely dependent upon other people. He's, he's just, what is he like, everybody? Go back to chapter 18 and read verse 17. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. For here is a man, he's like a child. Why is he like a child? He's got nothing to offer. He's just a destitute, ignored, bankrupt individual who will bring you no good because if you got him chopping vegetables, well, you wouldn't want him chopping vegetables or doing any other job, really, would you? He's a blind man. And he's a beggar. Hey, so we're going back to what happened with the children and we're thinking, Here's a man who's going to get some blessing very likely, isn't he? He's, he's qualifying. He's a beggar. He's, he's not coming in his own. Well, I can do this. I can do that. 
He knows from beginning to end in his life, he's ignored by the people. He knows he's good. He knows he's, he's like the little child. And we've learned already that it's the little children who can bring nothing. It's, it, it's that type of person who gets the blessing. You're feeling secure this morning full of your own self-achievement, full of your own status, full of your own education standards, full of, well, you're not fit. You're not in the right place for salvation. This man, this man, he's right there. He, he's, he's ticked the box number one. Like a child. Well, let's go on. Let's go on. Chapter 18. And we're in verse 36. And hearing a crowd going by he inquired what this meant just a little point people who are deficient in one sense are often very hypersensitive in another sense aren't they i.e somebody you can't see is very often very sensitive in a hearing realm and this man is very sensitive in a hearing realm so he hears what is going on he hears this commotion of a crowd going by and he inquires what this meant they told him jesus of nazareth is passing by and he cried out jesus son of david have mercy on me Okay. He cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They say Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the latest, we might say, man making an impact, but he's just Jesus of Nazareth. Like many other people who've made something of an impact, he isn't beyond them, but this man sees he is. <laughs> this man sees he's the son of david this man sees his messiah this man he sees he is the king who is coming to fulfill all of the promises of the king who is from god son of david the eternal king the king who is god set to rule and to reign he sees beyond you see he's got something going on inside he's discerning the scriptures and he is realizing that this man jesus is not just jesus of nazareth he is yeah he was true jesus of nazareth the true historical figure but so much more so much more the son of david and so attach that back to where we started today this, this, this realization, according to the prophets, that one would come, and this one who would come was the one who was going to die to make salvation. The Son of Man is the Son of David. See this man starting to get going, and he's on the right track. And he says, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me and we say ding ding hey we've seen this before let's go back in chapter 18 and let's see a man who's conscious of his own worthlessness of his own emptiness and we'll see him in verse 13 but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Lord Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house, justified. This man got the blessing. This man who realized he needed mercy. He was a man who realized that a sacrifice was needed to be offered in his place in order that he might be the receiver of mercy. Ah, so we're seeing that this blind man, yeah, he's really on the right track, isn't he? 
Uh, not only is he like a child, but he's the one pleading for mercy, pleading that there would be for him compassion in all of his need. And he's crying out to the one he believes can bring that compassion into his situation. Nobody else, everybody. Nobody else, just the king who is the son of David, just the Lord Jesus Christ. The message is the same today. I'm not adding to it. I don't want to take away from it. I just want to tell you that the son of man who's the son of David, who is Jesus Christ, he's still the one who we need to cry out and we say, have mercy on me. Notice the energy. He's crying out, have mercy on me. I don't have the word myself. I need to be transformed. So we're seeing, hey, this man seems to be going on the right track. Let's see some more then. Let's see some more with this blind man. We see then in verse 39, and those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. And very likely they were saying, Jesus has got some business. He's going to Jerusalem. He's going through Jericho. Don't hold him up. You're just a beggar. You don't want him to be troubled by somebody like you. And he they are, they are rebuking him, telling him to shut up and be quiet. <coughs> this man would not shut up and be quiet. We're in verse 39, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Ding, ding. That should ring a bell again, shouldn't it? Who's the first person in Luke chapter 18 who got all the blessing? The one who was persistent. The one who was not put off. The one who kept going to the judge and saying, I want justice. And the Lord says, if you go back to the beginning of the chapter, the first eight verses, verse seven, and will not the God give justice to his elect? To his elect who cry to him day and night. Will he de long, delay long over them? Ah. We see. Here's a man. He won't be put up. He says. You won't stop me shouting out. Because I've got to have. What this man can offer me. The one alone who can offer me. There's no other son of David who will turn up tomorrow or next week or in five years. He's the only one and he's passing by. And this man says, I've got to have what he can give me. Because if I don't have it, my life will continue in this deep mess. Begging in my blindness. So... We're not surprised then by verse 40, are we? That a man who's like a little child, that a man who's crying for mercy, and that a man who won't be shut up, the Lord Jesus stops. Just notice that. And Jesus stops. Right here today in Belton Evangelical Church, if we come in the same manner, Jesus will stop and he will take an interest in you. I say this to us as fellow Christians. It is a real issue, isn't it? That we, that we drift on in our lives and our faith becomes a bit tepid, doesn't it? We, 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 we don't want people to perhaps... We don't want to stand out. We don't want to be this sort of some religious freak. And, and we don't make a big thing about it. And we just sort of fade away with our zeal and passion. And I just want to say to us uh, this morning, would you be crying out? That the son of David have mercy upon me? Are you desperate to know him? Are you desperate to have Day by day, the reality of the one who is the bread of life in your life. 
People should know by the conduct of our lives that we are passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ. What would people say about you who you were? What do my family say about me that I'm passionate about? I fear I'll make confession to you. Made a few confessions lately. I fear sometimes I'm more passionate about whether Arsenal win or not than about whether there is glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. I confess my weakness. Are we desperate? This man was desperate. His heart was, I want this. I want this. I want what this man can offer more than anything else. Well, let's see then. We carry on. And Jesus did stop and he commanded him to be brought to him. It's, it's a beautiful thing in the Gospels how the Lord Jesus just really does interact with people. He doesn't just, just sort of throw out a blessing and then say, well, he's got a blessing. We'll move on. He just really interacts with people. That's, a, again, a lesson for our ministry. Parents, don't just sort of say your children want this and throw something to them. Interact with them. Talk with them. And in our ministry and dealing with people, take time to stop and interact with them. And not just, dare I say, throw out some money or throw out some blessing. Well, let's go on then. He commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came, he asked him, what do you want uh, to me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. He's very specific. He knows his need. Notice he says, Lord, as well. It's all an interesting thing. He realizes that he's the Lord. He realizes he is the all superior, significant one. Again, brothers and sisters in Christ, never forget that Jesus is Lord. I've said it many times. We're happy to call him Jesus, but there's a beautiful sense to call him Lord. It's, a, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's far better because he is Lord. Okay, now he knows what he wants. He's very specific. This is a great parallel, you see, unfolding the whole issue of us embracing salvation. We should need, no, we need to know what we want. Lord, I want, the, I, want, I, I, I want you to renew me. I want the forgiveness of sins. I want, the, I, I, I want my, my whole being to be transformed by you because that is my basic need. The basic need that he expresses is reflected of how we should be knowing our basic need, which is the reality of our sin. And we should be looking to the Lord. And so carry on in verse 33. And Jesus said to him, recover your faith. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you. And the idea is your faith has saved you. Your faith has given you salvation. That's the idea of being made well. It's the word sozo. It is the salvation word. You're saved. You're saved. Your faith. How did he have faith? Well, He's desperate. He does, he's got nothing to offer. He's pleading for mercy. He's desperate for mercy. He keeps coming and he receives. Here is a man of faith. I just want to pick up here one thing. Perhaps you're not a Christian this morning and you think, well, I've been trying for a while. I've been seeking for a while. And I say to you, keep going. Keep going. Don't give up. <laughs> You truly come in God's time, he will reveal. He will reveal himself and he will say to you, your faith has made you well. Save. He's got that salvation that we thought about right at the beginning. He's received it into his life. Yes, his eyes are open physically, but it's a great picture of his spiritual being transformed as he receives the Lord Jesus Christ and is saved, rescued from his sins, delivered into blessing and eternal life with the Lord. How great is the message of salvation? How great is the encounter that this man has with the Lord Jesus Christ? And now he's a saved man. Rescued. Verse 43. We will read. Then it immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. So stop where we were at the beginning. Chapter 18 and goes into chapter 19. 
it's almost like, hey, hold on, everybody. What is a true disciple? And now we've had be revealed to us this man who is a true disciple, and he's one who goes on to follow him. He's one who's been, who's humble before God in all of his beggarly brokenness. He's pleaded for mercy from the true king. He's, he's persisted and he's received the blessing and he follows on the glory, glorifying God. Glory fine. Speaking well of God. And that's what it is to be for ourselves as we go forward. What do you think of the final words there? What does it make you think about? Glorifying God and all the people when they saw it gave praise to God. I don't want to, I don't want to overforce it, but the sense it gives me is that's a heavenly kind of scene. <laughs> That's a heavenly activity, glorifying God, and everybody giving praise. That's a, that's a heavenly scene. That's what takes place in the glory of heaven. And it's in that glorious heavenly scene has been brought, has been experienced on earth. <coughs> this man has come, and he's come to be a follower of the Lord. Jesus Christ. When we come as the people of God to worship the Lord together, we should have something of this happening, whereby those who have been transformed like this, a beggar, a blind beggar, have been now brought to the Lord Jesus, that we come as a glorifying God people, and it's the group of people who are praising the Lord. We should have heavenly experiences. I think we should have more. I feel we should have more. And I feel that I need to face up to the reality of being more prepared for worship. More prepared by, as it were, realizing who I am, like a Brian, like a blind beggar here, and realizing what the Lord has done for me. And then there would be more of this glorifying and praising God together as we're more prepared into the worship of the Lord. As we go into, into this week, I just want to send you into a having the experience of the blind beggar experience, and therefore having more of this sense of how. Good God has been to me and glorifying God. And perhaps then next week, our worship might be bigger and better. As we are just coming, wow, isn't God so great and so good? And we'll be praising the Lord uh, together. And we'll be having great anticipations of heaven. I think it's a heart thing. I think it's an experience of God thing. Well, everyone, our eyes must be open. And our eyes are open as they were for this dear man. Everything changes. So it will be for us. If you're not a Christian, embrace this one. Go receive his salvation. If you are a Christian this morning, let's. Let's be rescued from our, dare I say, our drifting on. Let's have real passion and knowing with the Lord in our lives. Well, it's been good to hear the word of God. Now we're going to sing a final hymn. I believe it'd be a hymn that this man could have very happily sung uh, and really appreciated uh, as he just wanted to know the Lord Jesus Christ.